when we immigrated from Zimbabwe, my family and I, in 2004 or three. Um, so that was my mm -hmm. mother and my sisters, and we lived in Sarnia first, and then we moved to London a couple of years later just to go to school at Western. Mm -hmm. um, so my mother's a nurse. I think I've mentioned that before. She's been a nurse for 40 plus years. She's also a midwife back home, also recognized as such in the UK. So she's practiced in the UK, Zimbabwe, and Canada. Um, and currently is a forensic uh, mental health nurse. My sister is a lawyer. She opened up her law firm as the pandemic hit. My other sister is a food science philosophy double major, and the other one's a food science uh, major as well. Um, now, when we first moved to Canada, of course, there's that culture shock and all those pieces. So I did go to nursing school here in Canada, but I didn't start off with nursing school. My first degree from Western was actually women's studies and feminist research. Um, and that's where maybe a little bit of that confusion comes for a lot of us immigrants when you come here and you're doing your own research or you're meeting with counselors and pieces like that. You don't, you're kind of confused as to which path to go. And that's how I ended up in women's studies. I loved it. A lot of writing. Um, therefore, I didn't go forward with it. Um, and then I remembered, oh, yes, I did like at some point wanted to be a nurse like mom. So I started researching into that. And then I decided to get my PSW. Um, and worked as a PSW for several years just to figure out if I truly wanted to be in healthcare. Um, and then I did go to Ryerson for, for my BSCN. Now, um, the Canadian, I guess, um, school system is, is a bit different like any other country. Um, I, I did find that it was a little challenging to navigate in regards to you know, there's college courses, university courses, and things like that. Back home, it's kind of like um, you just do your A-levels, advanced levels, and that then you kind of go to university. We don't necessarily do the whole college, university kind of thing unless um, to get a degree, that is. Um, so um, what I did find as an immigrant and uh, a black person moving into Canada, we, we were colonized by British, so to, by Britain. So our English is a little bit more on the British side. So I did find I was being marked down a lot because my English and my, you know, the way I explained things is not necessarily the way we explain things here in Canada. And now I'm kind of in the middle. Sometimes I forget, um, but that's okay. Um, but, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's a challenge that um, when I'm just trying to get, our other VP on Esther, when she logs on, that's something that she also kind of struggled with too, is because she's from Ghana and the, once again, the British. And so sometimes she spells color with the O-U-R and then gets marked down as well, right? So I think that's another part of like just being in the black community that people don't really speak on is just the difference when you migrate, even with the language. Um, a lot of people think that because of, um, because of the narrative, the one vision perspective where they look at, for example, Jamaica, you know, other islands in the Caribbean, and also just in the general continent of Africa, they think like, oh, it's huts, it's this, it's that. Um, and they don't recognize that we actually do learn like the Queen's English, you know, so the adjustment isn't English to English. It's, it's not, um, it's not like, oh, they speak Patwa or they speak, um, you know, tree is the first language because English is predominantly the first language of a lot of those countries because they were colonized by Britain, right? So I think that's something that's a really good point that not a lot of people realize is that it's not really a transition from like a foreign language to English. It's more just two different types of English language that's barriers. Right. So that was like really, yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah. So, um, I do find that it's, it's very important that we also maybe, uh, place emphasis on the fact that you are a bilingual person by virtue of, you know, I speak Shauna, mm -hmm. I speak English. Um, so sometimes your brain has to kind of do a shift or you have to translate sometimes in your brain what you're trying to bring across. And I think sometimes when you're in different settings, sometimes people perceive that as you don't fully understand um, the English language. And then, you know, I only started learning about microaggressions much later on in my existence here in Canada, where, you know, it always surprised me mm -hmm. that people would be like, oh, you sound English, good for you, or, 
did you learn English as a child or all these things? And I always wanted to share a lot of my experiences, um, you know, but I, I think kind of trying to break down some of those uh, um, assumptions that, you know, when you're coming from Africa, your education system is not at par with Canada um, or, or any of the, you know, North American, European countries, first world is, is, is usually a place to maybe begin with that. I, I sometimes think even in the education system, um, a lot of that still is very much there. So then it kind of builds into our experiences as black people and as black nurses. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, do we have the other lady on? Um, yeah, so she's getting situated. I'm trying to chat her on, on WhatsApp. But in the meantime, I kind of want to touch on the mental health aspect because I think that was like a big part of what a lot of people wanted to hear from you. Um, and one of the questions was kind of, how did you navigate through being Black in the mental health sphere? Because there is a lot of kind of bias or stereotypical thinking within the Black community about mental health. So do you find that with your patients that's something that you are challenged with? Like, are there supports for, for Black patients who are going through mental health crisis um, because their family might not understand? Or is that something that is not really existing right now? Um, so maybe I'll just kind of uh, start off with a little bit of my history. So today I had a hard time deciding how maybe this discussion should kind of flow. You know, do we beat about the path of the challenging experiences of Black nurses in Canada? Would we maybe focus on other areas that are more encouraging to our growth? So I really like your question when it comes to, um, you know, is the support there? And, and, you know, when we dig really into those cultural um, aspects, from our, well, I'm from Zimbabwe. And um, if I'm being honest, mm -hmm. mental illness back home was never really something that was visible. We always used to just say that person is mad. And that was it, right? We see some acting yeah. maybe out of the norm. Uh, bear in mind, everyone's norm is different, but out of, you know, the norm that we as a society kind of create, it would always be like, oh, they're mad, stay away from them, they're mad. Here I come in and, you know, there's all these um, hospitals and mental health hospitals. And I'm like, oh, what's up with that? You know, kind of thing. And so getting into mental health was never really something that I thought would be in my path. It kind of fell on my lap. And uh, a lot of what I say to students is keep your options open. Keep your mind open. Um, I always thought mm -hmm. there would be, like, a lot of, like, you know, assault, a lot of uh, just loudness and, and people banging themselves on things and, you know, just what we see on TV, like an asylum kind of scenario. Um, yeah. So I started off in uh, musculoskeletal rehab, and unfortunately, I I did get a workplace injury there, which is where I, I kind of was assaulted by a patient. And at that time, um, full-time opened up in mental health in the same institution. And as that opened up, I applied for it, and people kind of thought, like, you know, you just went through this assault, and you now want to work in mental health. And I said, of course, because there's all these safety uh, precautions in place, and I think I'll feel a whole lot safer there. Granted, when I started there, I, I really kind of was worried and constantly watching my back and only to realize, like, these are regular, everyday people like you and I. And if we really look at it, we all have, we, we all have things, right? Um, people are dealing with depression, anxiety, or uh, what have you, and all of that falls under mental health. Um, now, getting into mental health as a black nurse, yes, I, I did have my own assumptions and biases based on how did I grow up. Um, and a lot of the things that were bringing people to the hospital, I couldn't always relate because I didn't grow up here. And some of the challenges um, mm -hmm. that if we are being truthful that Canadians, white Canadians and maybe other Canadians um, structure as what affects their mental health, um, like that intergenerational trauma, um, rejection and all those pieces. Culturally, we didn't really have to deal with a lot of that in that sense. So back home, we have you know, yeah. um, the village 
kind of supports everybody, right? Everybody has a role um, in all those pieces. So when I hear people coming in and their stressors are related to having to do everything themselves and all those pieces, I couldn't quite relate to that because, again, at home, we have maids, we have gardeners, where everyone has a role. So you don't always find yourself in that situation where you're so hampered with all these things that are expected of you, you get into maybe an anxiety uh, episode, you have depression and all those pieces. Granted, those pieces exist, um, and uh, more so mm -hmm. I've, I've kind of really seen how they do manifest in, in black folks here, but it's taboo. Um, it's, it's kind of like an unspoken thing. It's like go to church. This is how you resolve this. Do that, do this. Mm -hmm. But we don't openly um, want to admit that maybe I need treatment, right? So it took a lot of time for me to um, get into the books, get into people's experiences and all those pieces. Now, is there support um, in the hospitals? Cultural humility is uh, something that a lot of institutions are really working hard at. So I just remember that sometimes things that would get maybe a black patient upset would be things I understand as a black person coming from Africa, things like someone pointed at you near your forehead. We don't do that back home, especially when it comes to people that are older than us. We don't speak to them pointing, right? So that gets somebody upset and people think, oh, no, they're just aggressive. It's just a form of disrespect that we don't understand culturally when it comes to um, where this person is coming from. Asian people, many times we see not looking in the eye and all those pieces. We're documenting that as poor eye contact. Is it poor eye contact? No, because culturally, they don't necessarily look into your eyes, right? So being aware of those pieces, I found, was part of my journey, kind of um, being that person that kind of maybe sometimes challenges everyone around me. Let's think deeper, right? For example, uh, we had a lady that, um, you know, she would go in a corner and start praying, but she'd be speaking in tongues. And that would be assumed to be like, you know, like, oh, yes, responding to unseen stimuli and all those pieces, but she's praying, right? So how do we get to a point yeah. where we're not medicalizing everything, we're really kind of digging into, um, is there a cultural aspect to some of these pieces as nurses? And I think that's where black nurses a lot of the times come in with these experiences. It's unfortunate that a lot of the times what we do see is we're excluded. Um, I don't like to say we're, we're underrepresented because that assumes that we're included to begin with. I don't think we're included at all yeah. when it comes to sitting at, you know, at the table where some decisions are being made, um, where we're deciding around what training do we give our staff um, in regards to recognizing different cultures, diversity, and all those pieces. We're not at those tables. Um, very rarely when you do see one of us at those tables, do they really have um, the impact we're hoping they have, right? So we see um, a lot of uh, barriers when it comes to that, when people that look like us are not in spaces where we're seeking those services and supports. Because for me, I, you know, what I've heard, we went to Black Lives Matter, the protest a couple of years ago, maybe three now, I, I can't remember, 2020, I think. Um, and I was, um, supporting um, uh, the organization I was working for. And the question that really uh, humbled me at that point was several people coming up and saying, oh, there's black people that work there. I did not know. Because I have all these experiences coming from a war-torn country and all those pieces. Um, would they understand? I have these experiences of racism in the workplace. Would they understand, right? So I think it's very important to remember that we have professionals that are available to support, but also um, as black people, we tend to also have a mistrust in the system and we need to figure out how we can get to a point where there's more um, inclusion and that also just brings such a richness to the services that we provide in any aspect of our healthcare here in Canada. Mm -hmm. I think, I, honestly, I think you're absolutely right because um, like you said, institutions weren't really designed to be inclusive at all. They weren't really designed for um, us to be in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And so it's like when you ask how can we make it more inclusive, it's like, well, it wasn't really inclusive to begin with. <laughs> it wasn't really um, meant 
for us to be in that space in the beginning. And that's why it is so important that not only do we end up in those spaces, but like you said, we make that impact. Um, and personally, for example, when I was working at the vaccination clinics, I always love to tell a story. I was um, working and then, they, you know, there's a lot of hesitancy within the black community to go and get vaccinated, especially during the beginning. And they wanted to kind of have a day just for the black community. They set it up pretty close to my home. And so I went as a black healthcare professional. They kind of sent out a general call, like, oh, if you're a black healthcare professional, come in. And I went in. And then the thing is, I saw all the, the healthcare professionals, the immunizers were black, but the supervisors weren't. But the people who were kind of checking us in weren't. And then the actual organization, the actual event was kind of sloppy so it was like oh um where is the real representation where it needs to be like the supervisors could have also been you know black or at least people of color like but if you're doing a, a event for the black community they could have been black um supervisors because they exist it's not like they don't exist they exist um but it's just that are they welcomed into those spaces right and then if not then impact are they having in the community at all yeah, so that's, that's, I think we're seeing that in a lot of things when it comes to, you know, we, we collect stats, Health Canada likes to collect all, all these stats, and we've been challenged in different spaces. Uh, when I was a manager, we were asked about stats, where are your stats that show that, you know, the people coming to you, what is the race and all those pieces, you know, everybody kind of sometimes, a lot of the times people do not feel comfortable asking those questions. Um, and an example I'll give you right now is I'm working in the vaccine clinics. When we ask questions about race, some people are okay with it, but some people get stuck on the wording that we use. Um, so, you know, that's how we decide a lot of the times to have these events that are kind of specific to a certain population. And I'll tell you, working in the vaccine clinics, and I've been very open with that, the black people are not coming. Where are they? Where are they and why are they not coming should be the question we're asking. We can all events and all those pieces, that's wonderful. Um, but I think looking at the root causes of, um, of some of these pieces is where maybe we'd get a lot of traction. Are black people welcome in these spaces? I would argue that we are, but we also, um, I think just from our experiences in spaces like that where it's healthcare related. I mean, the evidence is there. We don't have to, you know, uh, uh, beat it to death about, you know, our, our, um, our outcomes in the healthcare system are remarkably lower, right, than they are for our white counterparts and all those pieces. Even worse for black women, especially when it comes to um, uh, birth rates and all those pieces, right? So. There's this deep-rooted trauma that a lot of black people have faced, whether personally, maybe a family member or a friend, that they attach to anything that is related to healthcare, right? Um, so having people that look like us certainly makes a difference, um, but sometimes we also have to dig deeper. If I'm in a position of power, per se, do I speak for all black people? That's where sometimes then we get a little bit lost in all of this. So I think it's important that, you know, I'm not sure how we make some of the decisions around those uh, events that we have, but I think it would be important if people that do look like us that are being kind of uh, the focus of these events actually have a say in how these events run. Now, I can't really comment on that because I'm not sure. I'm just vaccinating at this point. Um, but I would encourage mm -hmm. if, if if black people feel, yes, I, this is what I would like to see, right? You can connect with the health unit and see um, and kind of bring your thoughts to the table as to what you think would work best for the community, for the black community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I definitely think that's a good point. Um, I didn't really get a chance, but Esther is kind of in the corner. Um, she's our VP of Finance at CBNA Western. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to quickly introduce her. Um, as I was mentioning before, Esther, um, we were just talking about the difference between, you know, education systems um, and the experience of migrating from 
place to another and how that kind of changes and, and versus in the nursing role. Hi, Esther. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay, so um, so that's how I went into mental health and now I've special, I, I do have a specialty certificate in, in uh, psychiatric and mental health nursing. Um, and, uh, you know, what I think I would like to see more of, especially in, in the sector in regards to mental health is, is uh, you know, maybe a little bit more focus on how do we get people from different um, black communities because we, we all have different backgrounds. You know, I grew up in Zimbabwe. Someone else may have grown up maybe um, in, in, um, in, in Ghana or someone else may have grown up in Rwanda where, you know, there's, there was that whole genocide thing and all those pieces, right? So it's, it's good to figure out how we can bring some of all of these pieces into play so black people feel comfortable seeking mental health support when they need it. I am one of those people that struggled when I got assaulted. Struggled to realize that as nurses we're, we're, bad, we're bad patients to begin with, but also realizing that I actually needed psychological support. I needed to see a psychiatrist. I needed to, to see a psychologist slash counselor to kind of, you know, um, unpack some of that trauma because it was not an event that could simply be swept under the rug. I was having... Um, yeah. I was having symptoms, uh, PTSD related symptoms to that event, right? So it comes to a point where sometimes you don't have a choice but to accept that help, but you don't have to wait until such a point where um, maybe, you know, you've really deteriorated or maybe you've engaged in, in, in um, self-destructive behavior. Um, but how do we, kind of, I think it also goes into the churches as well and all those pieces, right? So how do we integrate some of these pieces along with our faith and other aspects that affect our lives as black people? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, definitely. Because, I mean, I myself consider myself like a person of, you know, faith and I like to go to church and those kind of things as well, right? So um, it is really tempting to just kind of, push away the, like, healthcare system and, and focus on, oh, we can pray for this person, we can do this, especially within the black community, because that's something that not only were we built on from back in slavery days when, you know, the Bible's kind of all we really had to look forward to in terms of um, hope, and it was introduced to us through Europeans, but also from the perspective of nowadays when we when we have continuous church and those kind of things. So I think you're right. Like integrating it, I personally feel like it would be, I personally feel like it's going to be challenging for me at least just because it's very one or the other. It's very um, the healthcare system, especially because of our past, might not be a safe space. So then it's like how do you go to them to then facilitate those hard discussions. How do you then advocate for yourself? And then when you're not feeling heard, it's very easy to just be like, okay, cool. I'm not going to go over to that space anymore. I'm going to focus on this. And then, like you said, it comes to a point where people are having, you know, night terrors and, and signs of PTSD, but we're just like, oh, no, it's okay. We're going to pray for this person. And that's amazing. But at the same time, we also need to make sure that we're checking in um, physically as well as spiritually. So... When it comes to the mistrust in the healthcare system, I'm, I'm a big advocate for education. Educate yourself, ask mm -hmm. questions, advocate for yourself. Your biggest advocate will always be yourself. As nurses, um, part of what our college calls us to do is to advocate, but sometimes we find it difficult to advocate because we ourselves are being oppressed in our workspaces, right? We often hear about, um, um, black people receiving diagnoses that really do not align with what's happening without much further testing. I often say then you need to ask for a differential diagnosis. What else could it be? What tests have you run? How did you come to that conclusion? A lot of the time, hopefully that helps the person that is doing this, you know, uh, the physician and the nurses and all those people to pause a little bit and think about how did we come to that, you know. 
it's part of checking your bias as well. We are biased as well ourselves. Like I shared earlier on, I struggled with how do I kind of align with some of the experiences patients I was supporting um, were experiencing because I have my own unconscious bias around, well, it kind of should be like this because if I can do it, then you should be able to, right? Um, we are built as black people to be uh, resilient, a term that many of us, I don't think, appreciate because it almost shifts um, accountability and responsibility to the victim uh, versus holding other people accountable. Yay, you, you've, you know, yes, you've, you've uh, overcome this thing that was imposed upon you and all those pieces. So I think as black people, we struggle with some of these pieces because we're built to accept hardship. We are... We grow up being told that, you know, we should take care of other people, including our black men, mm -hmm. if we're being honest. But when you look at everything as it is, who's looking out for the black women? Nursing is predominantly women. Um, you will find black male nurses in, in, nurse, in, in the nursing field, in, but predominantly you'll find more of black women. So how do we get to a point is, is, you know, a lot of the questions I normally like to get to. Like, what ideas can we come up with that support us to move from, okay, yes, we know there's so much research we're beating about that a lot. We all know what's happening. We all know it's oppressive in healthcare to black people. But how do we move from that as black people? How do we maybe educate ourselves so we find we actually are competing for those positions? You know, I, I think a lot of um, black nurses and black nursing students, if I'm being fair, we don't see a lot of people that look at, like us at the top. So we're just like, well, I mean, what business do I have going up there? If I tell you the amount of times I've, I've taught black students in the last four years that I've been teaching at Western and clinical instructing, I probably could count on one hand how many black students I have. And I'm not counting racialized folks. And that to me is very sad when students come to me and say, oh, I've never had a black instructor before. Oh, thank you so much for seeing me and yeah. hearing me. It shouldn't take a black instructor to see you or hear you, much like it shouldn't take a white instructor to see or hear you. But these are things that are happening within our field, right? Recently, RNAO did re release um, um, their research with their black task force that they put together after the whole George Floyd um, thing happened and all of that. And it was quite damning. But I was not surprised reading it. And I think that is very sad because these are our lived experiences, right? We're, we're excluded from positions. We're kind of kept at those entry-level positions. You don't really see a lot of black people in specialty positions and all of that. But what was interesting to me to see was black nurses are more found in those areas that are uh, physically demanding um, compared mm. to their white counterparts. Never thought of that really, but when you look at it, right? So how do we get to the point where, again, we keep, I, I, sometimes I struggle with how we keep doing all this research and looking at all these things. We know what it is. We're in 2022. Racism exists. Yes, there it is. We're being excluded. But how do we move from that? How do we have nursing school be more inclusive to the underserved populations, which usually are uh, um, people of color, right? So, and nursing school is yeah. expensive. So I don't think it's also a matter of, I don't wanna go to nursing school, but it's expensive. I'm still paying for nursing school as we talk. So how do we get to a point where the way it, we, we, we kind of select our students is not solely based on, on grades because, as we've seen, grades play a part, but they don't necessarily make what a nurse can be to succeed, right? Nursing is a people kind of um, profession. So how do we get to a point where we have a lot more people in, in those key positions? It starts with the education. We can't compete. We don't have a lot of black nurses in our universities. So how then can we expect to have a lot of black nurses in these uh, specialty positions and these positions of leadership and all of that? So I strongly believe that it starts right there. Those are your social determinants of health, right? Um, many people 
um, do not want to get into nursing itself because they hear their families and friends talking about what they experience in nursing. I am one of those people. But dare I say, let's challenge it anyways, right? Let's challenge the systems anyways and do something about it because it affects us in ways that um, are life and death, literally life and death. So how do we get into those positions? I'm happy to see that Western right now um, is working on some of those decolonization, anti-racism, anti-oppressive, um, kind of doing some research on that. I am in a, a part of the advisory group and I liked seeing some of the work being around starting at year one, right? Um, part of their research has shown that 70 plus percent of students in nursing school have indicated that they don't feel like they're taught enough about how to take care of people that don't look like them, right? And we see that in our textbooks, you know, how, how do certain things show up on the skin of darker skinned people? We don't know. I only know because I'm black, how I would anticipate. But what happens to our students that aren't? And what are we doing about that, right? So I think it comes down to making a decision as, as a collective around educating ourselves and challenging that status quo. And also at the same time, having the gift of goodbye. I find that a lot of the times we sit around and we normalize certain behavior, oppressive behavior, have the gift of goodbye when respect is no longer served at the table. Go find yourself a place where respect is served at the table, right? We are brilliant minds. Nursing school is hard. Um, we published a while back, it's harder to get into nursing school than it is to get into med school, right? So people that are getting into nursing school, like yourself, your brilliant minds of the future, um, and I, I cannot fathom that a lot of the times we're kind of just still on those sidelines. How did I get into teaching? I actually did not think I'm good at teaching, and I applied. I'm not sure why I was applying, and I was surprised that I was, um, I was uh, chosen to, to be a clinical instructor, and it's been a very, I've enjoyed that journey, and I would love to see more black students, black nurses get into this a little bit more, right? Um, because that's also the only way we can affect change. We're not saying, uh, a lot of the times when we say we're excluded, I know some folks tend to believe that we're saying give us a pass. No, 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 there's lots of educated, well-qualified people that are black, they're just not given that opportunity for a variety of reasons, right? So some of the- uh, Exactly, exactly. And mm -hmm. Carry on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> for sure. I feel like I had a, a few questions and um, you've kind of answered most of them because coming from like Ghana, I'm still, I still call myself like, you know, a newcomer, even though I've been mm -hmm. time, but I'm still trying to understand the system and um, like I've not, being exposed to i guess you know all these things <laughs> um just because in ghana we are very like um accepting irrespective of i guess your race your color or not we still embrace you so uh, coming here was quite like a shock for me mm -hmm. still getting to it um but some of the questions that i would ask myself is why is it i guess 2022 and these things are still out there like I just cannot understand why as you had mentioned there's like research on them and it's still ongoing so I'm like like why why is it still ongoing what can we do you know to make a difference and when I read um about you and I I read that you were a clinical instructor I was extremely excited to <laughs> see at least like one black um clinical instructor you know I haven't seen that even in nursing school we barely like I've only had one professor who was um black which was a bit confusing for me so my question was is it that black people don't educate themselves to get to those leadership positions or is it that they are not given the opportunity to um you know serve within such um positions and then I think you had spoken about that as well but I'm still wrapping my head around <laughs> so what I always say is when it comes to any isms that are to do with, that are oppressive in nature, racism, ageism, classism, sexism, they're so illogical. And I have started moving from asking why is this person treating me this way to how do I get myself to a position where um, 
I'm the one that's making those decisions, right? Because um, we can ask all we want about racism. It doesn't even make sense, if we're being honest. The color of my skin does not define, you know, my, my, my abilities and all those pieces, but it's still happening. And in 2022, we're still glorifying it with all this research that we already know. Um, we do a lot of research, but there's not a lot of action. There's a lot of recommendations and all these pieces. And honestly, when it comes down to it, in each organization, I always say it lays on the leadership in that organization. They're responsible for the culture that they cultivate in their organization. Zero tolerance policies. And when we say zero tolerance, it means even I as a CEO, it applies to me too. Another thing is don't investigate yourselves, right? And I've seen that where we come forward with certain things you know, maybe a leader has done this, that, and the other, but they're investigating themselves amongst themselves. How do you investigate your friend? How do you investigate someone that may have, um, um, you know, an impact on your income and all those pieces? I am. For, I worked for an organization that brings in an outside consultant who does the investigative piece and gives it to you. I still kind of struggle with that because then still the decision is still sometimes could be skewed based on how, you know, the organization is feeling. But I think those are some of the things that certainly could use some revamping, right? Now, have mm -hmm. I, um, I, I forget what your other question was. What was your other question? Sorry. Was it uh, my question? Yeah. Uh, I yeah. think I was asking about how we, um, how there's like, not a lot of um, black nurses in mm -hmm. leadership positions because I'm um, being a nursing student as well. I mean, that would be my hope, but then mm -hmm. not being such, you know, nurses in such places makes me concerned. I'm, I'm thinking, is it that we, I don't know, like how don't we get there? So it was a question that I've been so, asking me for a while. So I hear you mention um, having seen one black instructor. I went to school in Toronto and I'm going to be honest, when I first got to Toronto, got my apartment, and I'm walking to school, I was shocked. It was a feeling like no other because it's it's quite diverse in Toronto. I was used to being in these spaces in London where a lot of the times mm, I'm the only black person maybe. And so to me it was almost like a, where are these people coming from and how dare they, right? I'm used to being the only – I've had I had two or three instructors um, – in, in Toronto that were black mm -hmm. by virtue of it's a larger body of diverse individuals and all those pieces. London is diverse when we really look at it. We're seeing a lot more black people, we're seeing a lot more uh, brown people, racialized people are, are here. But there's a lot of research too that points to London being um, very, very well deep rooted with, those, with racism and all those pieces, mm -hmm. right? So is it a matter of we need to educate ourselves I argue that it's not um, because I see a lot of educated um, folks that are black, that are nurses, that still somehow are not getting to the top. Sometimes I also do see that a lot of people don't apply because we are, um, we're kind of taught to, to not even try to go there because we're not going to get it anyways, right? Um, or maybe we've seen our peers that look like us that have tried but they never get there and yet they're brilliant brilliant minds um we often see uh people that are less qualified getting those positions although we've we've kind of proven ourselves so a lot of the times it's it's i don't think it's a matter of at, like education and all those pieces i think it's a matter again it comes down to the culture the leaders um that want to hang on to those it's kind of like a social order, right? The systems work, work the way they were designed to work. Um, and at this point, we're just really trying to challenge those systems and say, uh-uh, right? You want to talk about uh, humanity and all those pieces, and yet you do not really treat us like human beings, right? We're, always, we're almost always treated like less than, and that's the reality of it. You were questioned a lot about where's your education. I get that a lot. Were you, did you get your nursing education in Canada, Right. And a lot of the times you can tell by the tone that this is not about an interest about where I got my education. Okay. It's the everyday microaggressions around, well, your education may not be 
up to par. We see it right now with our internationally educated nurses. They end up being PSWs. But lo and behold, in the pandemic, when we have no other choice, all of a sudden, the opportunity is there for them to finally work, right? So it, it comes yeah. back to those deep-rooted racist tendencies of systems. It's systematic. Um, not always an individual thing, although individuals sometimes, yes, they do bear that responsibility, but it's systematic. And we've talked about approving the systems and starting again, but no one wants to do that. It costs a lot of money. Blah, blah, blah. And honestly, sometimes, why would I want to do that if I am a white person sitting at the top and getting all these things? Why? It's, it's, it goes against all uh, self-preservation is the thing, right? So we all sometimes really think about ourselves as individuals and not a collective. So sometimes a lot of these things have just to do with what is the impact on everybody else. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have some comments um, that I'd just like to kind of read for you. So I'm going to go in order. So one of the questions was, what barriers do black patients face in healthcare, and how or what can nursing students do to kind of tackle these? So I think some of the barriers that we face as, um, as nursing students and nurses in general is, first of all, we talked about education. A lot of black people, sometimes you see that they're coming from not so well-to-do backgrounds. So how do you even get that education? Even when you come into, I've given away a lot of my books sometimes because my students don't have the money to buy the books. You know, I remember nursing school books up to here that would cost me $600. Um, and, you know, we're all trying to photocopy or try to figure out how do we split the money and all those pieces. Even though I was a working person that was able to, to you know, um, afford some of those pieces. So, yes, you get into nursing school, but can you afford the scrubs? Because some schools impose their own scrubs that are so expensive to buy. Can you afford not working full-time, maybe full-time and a half, to manage going to school and manage your expenses? Maybe not. So then at the end of the day, your education kind of suffers as well, right? So some, those are some of the barriers. And then some of the barriers that come with that is um, when you have a lot of other pieces that are happening in your life, I found that sometimes we're harder on black nursing students than we are on other nursing students, right? It's, again, it comes back to that notion that we, we should figure it out, we're resilient and we should be able to, or we're just plainly not believed when we say certain things. Um, so a lot of the times, what can we do about it? Honestly, I just think, I always say to students, don't dim your light. I've had students that are like, you know, I can see that they're looking at me differently because I know a lot of things. So I think I'm gonna tone it down because I don't want to make people angry. Don't dim your light, you know, um, figure out what's really important to you because nursing is a calling. We all say that. What are your values and how do, that, how do they align with what you're doing, right? And then you want to always be seeking more information from a place of inquiry versus blame and all those pieces. Because sometimes, honestly, the things that are happening to us don't always um, align with our perception of the events or the next person's perceptions of the events. So I would say our best way forward is we have the research, but we need to action what that research says. We need to hold our leaders accountable. Well, you know, you put out this statement and you put out this promise about X, Y, Z, and yet here we are two years later, we're still not seeing that, right? We see all these recommendations with the RNAO. We've seen, I've seen recommendations and, and promises in organizations around pieces that affect black lives and they, you know, it kind of comes and goes and passes, but it's ha we need to hold each other accountable, and we also need to hold those pe people in power accountable as well. Yeah. Definitely, I do. And um, I kind of grew up in the healthcare system mm -hmm. as well. So, like, from a patient perspective, I'd say that one of the ways you can kind of, like, help is by asking if you don't know, like, feeling, I guess, getting to a point where you feel comfortable enough to ask questions and to reach out to resources. Um, and if there is, like, something where you're not necessarily understanding or you feel like you can't relate to this patient, then kind of take yourself back and, and wonder why is that. And recognizing that a lot of times we like to say we are all the same 
or we like to say that everyone should be treated equally, but it's not really about equality because not everyone is the same, That's right. right? I'm not going to be treated the same as a male, right? Because I just have, I have different parts and things like that, right? Someone who I also identifies. I'm not going to treat someone who, you know, is transgender the same that I would treat someone who is cisgender because they have certain um, barriers and things that they're going to be going through. And so I have mm -hmm. to also make sure I'm accommodating to that as well and make sure that I'm understanding and doing my research on that as well. So in the same light that you're educating yourself on how to work with all patients, whether it's pediatric patients, adult patients, or people who identify as, you know, different different genders or identities, then you can also educate yourself and kind of elaborate on how to work with people of the black community um, and realize that you, you're you not going to treat us, like us the same all the time. Um, there's going to be things where, you know, you, you might not understand, like, for example, cultural differences of foods that I might eat that you might not eat, but it's okay because we eat different foods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when I'm saying, oh, maybe a patient has hypertension and um, you're saying lower their sodium intake, and I'm telling you, I eat a lot of, you know, Akian saltfish, which has a very high sodium, then you might not understand it, but it's okay. But we can adapt and we can kind of move on and you can educate next time and be like, what is Akian salt? What is she even talking about? And the next time you talk to a patient, you'll know what that is and you can kind of work with them. Mm -hmm. like, that's um, what I would say. Um, There's also another comment. Uh, kind of sorry, I just want to add to that. Mm -hmm. I am a firm believer of asking the patient, right? It's their experience. And so, you know, I've had to, I've supported our indigenous brothers and sisters, and to be honest, yes, while their history, when we look at it, when I did the course on that, is remarkably similar to what we've experienced in Africa, the boarding schools and places like that. There's aspects to when it comes to healthcare and all those pieces that we would never truly know. Um, it's always asking and being vulnerable. Listen, I don't know. And I'm just wondering, maybe you can guide me a little bit as to what do you need, what works for you, and kind of tell me a little bit about those pieces around the cultural. You're talking about food, right? Our food guide is Canada's food guide. It's based on the fact that we yeah. all eat certain grains and we all eat mm -hmm. this, that, and the other. We are not taking into account cultural differences, right? So it's, it's, it's always good to be a person that is not wanting to be all-knowing to the point that we forget that the patient in front of us is actually a human being that is capable of answering to their own experiences because they own those experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's, that's really key. I'm going to just read one of the comments. So... Some of the comments here are. So I had seen a comment that uh, just because people are in Toronto, they don't experience racism and all those pieces. I never, I never said that. I just said you see a lot more black uh, instructors in nursing schools and the like because again, the ratios there are probably higher than here, right? So it's quite, it's it's a larger area that is. Um, more diverse, um, but do they not experience the same challenges that we do? They likely do to a certain degree. They're, they're the same challenges, but also kind of different because we don't know. Um, but I, I wasn't uh, insinuating that because you're in Toronto, you don't uh, experience racism and the like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. Um, another one says the leaders want everything to stay the same. It, it is kind of like an us versus versus them mentality a lot of the times. Um, that's very true. I've been in leadership myself, and uh, you know, uh, a lot of the times there's uh, there's certain expectations that just again, it's the status quo that you don't want to disturb and all those pieces. Um, and our staff, a lot of the times, are just considered resources, right? They're not, we don't look at the person as a person. It's kind of like, what can you, I'm paying you to do this. Can you come to work? Can you do this? But we often forget that, you know, those very same nurses that we are asking to come in and do all this work, they also are people, right? So your working conditions count. 
um, what kind of schedules are we doing? Um, what kind of benefits do you have? And if, you know, um, someone dies back home, we have five, six day funerals sometimes. Um, are we going to be able mm -hmm. to, to kind of support some of those pieces, right? Um, we have our brothers and sisters sometimes that, like when we're talking about indigenous folks, um, they do ceremonies, smudging and all of that. How does that come into play when we're in a hospital system or any other setting? Do we have provisions for that or do we just decide that we're not doing that because, yeah, you know, it doesn't affect us. So a lot of the times um, I, I place a lot of emphasis on, on leadership because a lot of decisions are being made there and we start there, right? Um, and coming down and then also us as employees, we also play a lot, uh, a role in some of the things that we do. Um, but yes, that us versus them mentality does exist. And honestly, all it does is it's very divisive and uh, patients and, and, you know, population serves, served are the ones that kind of front the, the negative impact of that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so I'll just read another comment. Um, so just kind of adding to the previous point, just kind of stating that, oh, not necessarily that, just because you're in a racialized um, community or space means that there's no racism. So just kind of towards the audience to let them know that there is racism existent. There is even colorism existent. Um, but when you have a bunch of people who look like you. Um, so like you said before, like not that just because there's a bunch of, let's say, black people in the same space doesn't mean other things. Just like you said, that still play a factor into the treatment of just others and in, in inequitable conditions. Yeah, so that's your basic intersectionality, right? So intersectionality of race, gender, um, age, and all those pieces, they all come into play. When you're in a workplace and it's, uh, you know, white person, black person, whether we like it or not, uh, race becomes a factor. Um, black man, you know, uh, black woman, we're talking now gender. Right, so there's so many intersectionalities that affect our experiences, um, and and that sometimes kind of inform the outcomes of some of the pieces that we are we're seeing today. Um, and just because you're not in a in a in an environment that is diverse, yes, absolutely, there could be racism there. I mean, I've worked in environments where it's it's diverse. But racist jokes are still happening and people will say to you, but no, you're not Indian or no, you're not this, that and the other, right? There's hierarchies as to which race as well in all those pieces, right? Um, and then, you know, another piece is um, around um, something else I wanted to touch on and now I'm just forgetting. You find that um, you, you, you're you're encouraged to give your input, but your input is never really taken into account, right? So some, some of that is more performative. We see a lot of performative allyship. Hey, we want to hear your voice. We want to hear what your options are, but no one ever really does anything about it. It kind of goes the way that's decided over there, right? We see it even in our unions. Um, dare I say we even see it with our, uh, our regulatory bo bodies, right? Um, they don't necessarily have the stats mm -hmm. of that. But we do know, based on research, um, there's, a re there's research out of, I think it's Dalhousie, and much the same with the RNAO, where black nurses are faced with, um, you know, uh, they're we're often silenced, but our flaws are magnified, our mistakes are magnified. And a lot of um, reports to the college that don't have any merit, and yet we still face those disciplinary measures, right? There's no consideration for, hmm, you know, we see a lot of these um, uh, complaints coming through, and it's usually racialized folks. So this, that, and the other. Could it be malicious? No, we don't. We don't see a lot of digging into that. We just see a lot of like, well, this is what we expect, right? So, we. Mm -hmm. 
I think, again, at the end of the day, um, I think a lot of time is being spent on research. I argue that a lot of time should be spent on action items that we keep seeing coming out of research. Mm -hmm. Another, sorry, <laughs> I don't want to miss the comments. Another <laughs> um, set of comments says, we don't have the privilege of making decisions. Decisions are made um, and they're like what we follow and that's kind of that. They don't really change um, much for us. And then on top of that, Another comment that was written was, and when a black person does get the opportunities to be put into those positions, we don't look out for our community and our fellow black people, um, or we can't because we're already the token black person, right. you know, so it's like, there's no room for you. There's the tokenism, but also there's the worry, I think, sometimes of like, oh, hey, if, if I give Gail this chance, is she going to embarrass us and then close the doors for everybody else? I can only trust myself to be the one that shows people that, hey, we're capable, but can I onboard somebody else or support someone else's onboarding, right? We see that a lot. Um, we, we, even in education itself, we see that um, sometimes these people that are teaching these equity principles are actually oppressive people themselves. I could be teaching on equity principles, but I'm actually an oppressive person myself. A lot of these things comes back again to those performative pieces, not being able to uh, reflect on yourself or take, take responsibility. I have students that have basically told me my face, you know, is scary, you know. So I've now, and I understand that because this is my face, my tone is monotone. If I'm passionate, it almost sounds like, oh my goodness, like is she yelling or whatnot, right? And I understand, yes, there's that whole trope yeah. of the angry black woman that is attached to that, but there's also being aware that sometimes, yeah, sometimes, yeah, I kind of look the way I look and it could be scary. So how do I take responsibility for that? I now start off all my sessions with a new group by saying, my face looks like this, my tone looks like, I'm not angry, this is who I am. And sometimes, yes, I do talk passionately, but I'm always going to be that person that, you know, will tell you the truth and be very kind of straightforward with it. And a lot of my reviews from students, and I'm one of the highest uh, scoring instructors at Western in the School of Nursing, have come to, you know, you're very, um, we don't have to guess what you're thinking. You tell us as it is and all those pieces. Yes, I had to get used to your strictness. Some call it strictness. But, you know, I appreciate and value that more than thinking I'm doing well and then coming to the end and realizing, actually, I'm not doing so well, right? So we often mm -hmm. are finding ourselves to having to, uh, make ourselves work so hard, and I call it masking. We were talking about this earlier. Work so hard to make people around us feel comfortable around us, right? We're told to smile. We're told to be nicer. We're told to do all these things. And I, I ran an experiment. I so much about that for a long time in a place that I used to work. And I was told, let's try it for a day. And I tried it for a day. I was, and I said, you know, you better get ready for my 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 level of productivity to go low because I'm now spending all this energy on trying to do something that's not natural to me. The interesting part was yeah. the patients thought, well, why are you doing that? This is not your genuine self. Stop it. I feel like I'm in trouble. Are you trying to break bad news to me? So why are you smiling so much? You don't smile like this all the time. Like, why is your voice sounding like that, right? And then it comes back to, I always say, if you want to tell somebody that they look a certain way or they should smile, you know, we don't go around saying to people, Gail, you're too cheery. You need to, right? You need to tone it down because it makes me uncomfortable. And um, why are you happy? Mm -hmm. It's like you're, you're too happy, toned up. Your face is too smiley. Tone it down, right? And then it comes back again to those oppressive <laughs> things when people don't look a certain way or make us comfortable or whatever. Instead of looking within and saying, why is this a thing for me? We you know, impose on the next person and say, put our energies on, on that. Yeah. I kind of want to touch on what you said previously about feeling like you have to prove yourself because I think that's a big um, thing in especially the black community is like, oh, I got this A1 job and now I have to like work my butt off like I have to be the person who is always on time who always and it kind of like you said it puts that pressure it puts that idea of 
oh, black women are so resilient because you can give her anything and she'll do it on time because she's trying to prove herself to you, right? Because she's trying to be that person who shows everyone that not all black people are like this. Not all black people are like, you know, pegged as lazy or not all black people um, can are showing up to work later, you know, those things are trying to break those stereotypes of like, oh, it's going to start at, you know, black people time, right? So um, I think, like you said, those two ideas of needing to prove to others and then the strong black woman or strong black man narrative really coexist together because you have to be strong if you're going to put the world's weight on your shoulder, you know, and and it's not healthy. And then that ties right back into the mental health aspect. And then what do we do about that? We don't know <laughs> because either we feel like we have resources or maybe the resources actually just aren't there or maybe we just don't know how to utilize them. So I, like you said, it's one big kind of looping yeah. cycle of just pressure, strongness, resilience, then breaking and then realizing it's okay to break. And then maybe, you know, coming back to that. So yeah. like you said, it's really, it's really, <laughs> so it's it's a never ending toxic cycle, right? Because we yeah. we could recognize as black nurses that hey, this weight is too much for my shoulders. I'm gonna take a break, and we risk we risk running. You know, we risk the narrative then being you're lazy or this that and, oh she doesn't know what she's doing and this that and the other, um, or. You know, like I said, the research does show our flaws and mistakes. We're really making mistakes because we don't want to be um, risking being seen as, again, um, incapable. So I'll give you an example. I used to work with a variety of uh, psychiatrists and all those pieces, right? So in, in, in settings I've gone into, I've gotten used to being considered a fixer. Now, it comes from what we've been ingrained to be. Again, fixers, you do all these things and all those pieces, but when it time, comes time for you to want um, to voice your opinion about something or to go up a little bit in a ladder or whatever, it's kind of like, whoa, 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 right? Hold your brakes on that one. You're capable, you're showing us you're capable, but we, uh, we wanna keep you where you are. We're gonna overwork you. And I remember one day, like, you know, I'd always be cleaning up orders. I'd be doing this, that, and the other, making sure this, that, and the other is done. Oh, yes, someone's been arrested. I'll make that full phone call say, you need to return them. They're under a mental health act. You don't get to keep them, da, da, da. You know, or uh, peers, sometimes I, I worked with, a, I've worked with great groups of people, but sometimes there'll be just little uh, insertions in there of certain groups where, you know, they exclude you as the team leader, um, but when they're in trouble, guess who they're coming to, right? All of a sudden, and all those pieces. Or they disregard your recommendation, and then things go awry, and it's like, ooh, can you fix it? So you talk about we carry that weight on our shoulders, and we are on the go, go, go. I remember being asked one day by one of the psychiatrists, like, oh, my goodness, you're just amazing. What university did you go to? And I said, the university of you better work three times harder than your peers, because there's no room for error or mistake or this, that, and the other, right? We don't like being on all the time, but we almost always have to be on all the time, right? Because we sometimes are getting accused by patients. Um, and it's like, mm, yeah, except for that didn't happen. Very few people may have your back on that. We get accused by our peers. We get accused by our leaders. We get accused in all those pieces, right? Um, and then we come in, and we now have an opportunity to make a difference, but the people sitting at the table with you are not comfortable hearing it. So you end up dwindling yet again into a corner and being grateful for even being at the table, but you can't make any change, right? So mm -hmm. again, it comes back to either you keep beating on it and trying to hold people accountable and like, hey, let's do this, or you leave the table because it drains you sometimes to be that person. Um, and then you don't want to bring in other black people or, you know, and all those pieces because, again, we're, again, so ingrained to think we should be grateful for opportunities that we are overqualified for in the, in the first place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. I'm going to – that was an amazing part. I want to touch back on that, but I just also want to read the comments yeah. so that <laughs> they don't disappear again. <laughs> um, but – 
Um, so you got one thing. There's a CBC article published this month that I read, and it was interesting, titled Anti-Black Racism Deeply sorry, entrenched in nursing, um, says a new report calling for immediate action. So definitely recommending people go check it out. Oh, okay. Thank you for that plug. Um, and then you can read on the experiences of like black nurses in mm. Canada. So that was one of the... So I think that article was is like, relating to the RNAO Black Task Force. Um, and it's very good because... I think there were 17 of them, and then they, like, had, like, 300 on, like, um, you know, like, I don't know, like, what medium we were using for that, Zoom or something. And they've collected all these um, experiences of black nurses, and some of them are so damning. Um, you're kind of like, wow, here I was thinking I'm a human being, right? But some of these experiences bring that to question. Am I even viewed as a human being? They're so um, dehumanizing. Is, is a kind word to use here. And then at the same time, you know, we are still, a lot of us don't, uh, that article talks about how people don't report it because people don't believe you or they say, show me the evidence. And a lot of the times we find that um, with these aggressive acts of racism, it's not, it's not something you can really sometimes like actualize and say here, right? Unless Gail comes to me and says, you know, I'm not uh, because you're black and da, 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 and you're less than. Oh, oh, right. A lot of uh, the aggressive yeah. acts that are racism are ongoing aggressions that sometimes you can't. It's it's almost just an experience that you experience, but you can't really quantify with something to say here, right? So we're forced to walk mm -hmm. around with little notebooks to write notes about. Because I need to prove that, you know, I am, I am being abused here and it's because of my race, right? It's an interesting read would also be if you go on um, the Human Rights Commission of Canada, I believe it is, and they give you examples of what they would really consider um, um, racist acts and all these pieces, especially in the workplace. You will be shocked to find a lot of the things that we normalize as black people are actually against the code, right? The things that we've normalized, yeah. this whole smiling thing, this whole whatever thing. Um, and they really put it very well as to what the problem with that is, right? Because, yes, we can all ask each other to smile. It doesn't end there. Um, there's more deep-rooted meaning to that that they've done through research and have come to those conclusions. But if you go and read that, it also is like, oh, wow, I thought it's just, you know, but it's actually things that are happening to us in the workplace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And like you said, it, it's it's not something that's tangible all the time. It's more like someone said something and then you're like, oh, that's uncomfortable. And sometimes you as the person who is hearing this microaggression, if you're not really exposed to it and things, you don't even comprehend it at first. It takes you a while to talk to someone else in your community and then you're like, wait a minute. That was kind of, you know, that was kind of wrong. I didn't, I didn't realize at the moment, but coming back, that's kind of wrong. I remember, for example, this is back in elementary school. One of my elementary school teachers, she saw me with my afro out because I was wearing my hair for my birthday. And she said to me, oh, Gail, it's so great to see you with your, you know, hair out and everything. And you, you just usually are so conservative. And you're just, like, letting everything loose, and it's, like, just wild. And I was like, oh, okay. At the time, me being in grade 7, 8, I didn't really think much of it. I was like, oh, okay, she's my hair. But then now looking back, I was like, wait, so why is that hair less conservative than my, you know, braids or my, my wigs or whatever, my, you know? So I was like, why is it that this hair is considered wild? Why is this one considered, you know, like, so liberal, so, like, out of the ordinary, so reckless, but but my other hair isn't. It's and I'm like, I didn't change. I just changed my hair. <laughs> you know, there's really much to say. And then looking back at it now, I'm like, oh yeah. it's because she's not used to my hair. It's because mm -hmm. you know, it's because she's seeing straight hair. That's right. That's right. Or people that touch your hair without telling you they're touching your hair because your texture Yeah. Um, you know, so I just want to come back to some of those um, 
pieces around what can we do. We talked about zero tolerance um, um, in our mm -hmm. schools, in, in our organizations and workspaces, but that zero tolerance should also extend to people that witness these things and they do nothing, right? By extension, by extension of, um, because there's those power differentials, if let's say uh, director to director and you are a worker, and they notice another director being um, racist and aggressive and they do nothing about it, right? Much like for us, even with the college and all those pieces, abuse is abuse. If you don't stop your peer and, and all those pieces, you're equally responsible. I think that zero tolerance mm -hmm. means zero tolerance, not to just the aggressor, but the people standing by because they're encouraging this behavior by virtue of their silence, right? Um, holding everyone accountable for fighting racism, not just black people, not just the leaders, everybody, the expectation is, right? And so what that means for me is when I call you out because you're making a racist joke and it's inappropriate, I do not want to hear that now I'm the one that's under the radar for being aggressive and all those pieces, you understand? Because that's what, how it works sometimes. Um, and yeah. again, like some of these pieces around curriculum, we need to have those pieces in our curriculums. We don't, it's sad to me that I, if I see racialized students in a group, and now I've just started doing it with every group, I have to talk to them about what they'll encounter on the floor by virtue of the color of their skin. And what can you do as a peer, whether you're white or whatnot, to support your peer? We're not in the business of uh, changing people's minds and educating them. And we're just here to do our job as nursing students. But you see a patient, another nurse or whatever, and I've seen this where nurses sometimes, they don't want to deal with my brown student, but they want to deal with my white student, and they're all kind of, and I'm like, well, what about this one? And it's been powerful to teach that, but it's sad to me that I have to teach some of these things. Like, okay, this is how then you navigate that conversation. I am happy that sometimes these conversations, people actually didn't realize they're doing it, and they were opening, they were more open to talking about it. That's a win. But we also yeah. have to be ready that sometimes people are going to be like, uh, what? Like, and then it becomes a thing. Yes. And then, and you need to know how to kind of remove yourself from that situation. But the thing is, as it does, and I'm seeing beautifully commenting here, it leaves you second guessing yourself and your abilities and all those pieces. And that's not okay. Right? That's not okay at all. So I think as nursing educators and within our curriculum, some of these pieces should also come into play. I've had nursing students that have stood there and said, hey, you can't talk to this person like that. You know, like what's race got to do with this? La, 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 right? Versus just standing there and being like, and I've even taught that even when I've had staff teams, right? The person that's receiving mm -hmm. the abuse cannot be responsible in that moment anyways for saying, hey, don't talk to me like that, because we all react differently. We could be triggered. I could be just so appalled that someone said that to me, and I don't know how to talk. But if my peer is there, at the very least, hey, that's not, that's not cool. We don't, we don't talk like that here. Why do you think that's okay? Right? At least call out that behavior. Yeah. And that's how sometimes we can get some of these things mobilizing. Exactly, exactly. And once again, bring you back to my childhood, um, we always had those presentations about bullying, right? They'd always come to the school and go on about bullying. And of course, it's necessary. But what they'd always say is the bystander is just as much as an aggressor as the aggressor, because if you see something, you're supposed to say something, right? Um, but it's just really ironic how that doesn't transfer when it's race. Yeah. You know, when that's race, it's like, I'm not bullying. She's making a little comment or it's not you know that's not racist you know or oh that's not a microaggression um and then afterwards or afterwards someone might say something and be like oh um why do they say it like that or oh why what was going on but in the moment a lot of people don't want to say anything and i also feel like it's because people are also afraid to say, I guess, the wrong thing because they don't want to offend the aggressor and they don't want to offend you further. So I feel like they're just like, I'm just going to be quiet and hopefully this gets resolved. Um, so like you said, that education as to, okay, so what do you say mm -hmm. when you see it? Like, how do you go about How do you go about making sure that other people will say something? Um, and then 
I liked how you commented that when people come onto the floor, you kind of tell them, you know, this is what you might expect, because I never really had that conversation ever before, and I've always been the only black person in my little nursing placement group. <laughs> so I never really had that conversation. I've seen other people who are racialized, and I don't think anyone's ever talked to us about that before either. So I always, my favorite is coming from a place of inquiry. Ask the question, help me understand. When you do X, Y, Z, this is how it makes me feel. When you're placing focus on my peer, but, you know, I'm your student, it's making me feel incompetent. Help me understand what I can do to make this work. Or help me understand why you do not want to work with me today. This is what, I, talk about the behavior. I am noticing when I'm speaking with you, I'm not receiving a response. I am noticing that, um, you know, uh, um, I've kind of shared with you what my goals are today, but um, I'm, I'm not getting the same back. Help me understand what's happening and how can we make this work because I just really want to learn from you, right? Um, when, when, you know, and sometimes I'm a bit aggressive. I will ask you, like, are we having a racist moment? It just depends with my mood because sometimes you get so tired of constantly being nice about it mm -hmm. when it's very clear. And I will ask mm -hmm. you, are we having a racist moment? Help me understand what is happening here. Oh, we're not. Okay, so let's hear a little bit more about why do you think you can speak to me that way? And it's unfortunate that we do have to do some of those things, but it is tiring to constantly be wondering and looking and seeing the disrespect, but you're expected to keep that composure, right? It's much like when people survive domestic abuse and all of those pieces, and then one day they break, and then eventually maybe they kill their husband. Why didn't you keep your composure? Well, you know, my jaw's broken and all those pieces, blah, blah, blah. and for years I've tried to get help and I've tried to, I've tried to, and then you break and then it's kind of, again, shifting that blame on the victim. And so at the end of the day, yeah. sometimes it's okay to be aggressive. I'm going to be the person that says that. Um, but never place yourself in a situation where you're so aggressive that, again, it turns back to it's your behavior. Asking a person, hey, let me understand, are we having like a racist moment? I think that's perfectly okay, right? But also help me understand why you have no interest in working together. It seems to me you don't have any interest in working with me today. What can I do to, how can mm -hmm. we make this relationship work today when I'm here, right? And if that's not working, I also believe in systems of support. I always say to my students, I'm your person. I'm not, the nurses are great and I'm here to support, but my first responsibility is to the students. And I find it sad sometimes that sometimes, you know, that's not always the case um, with, with other people and all of that, and that's fine. But when we bring up our students to think that nurses eating their young is okay, um, and, and yeah. we also have... Um, we're not checking our power as clinical instructors. We're treating students differently because of a lot of different things. That in itself is damaging. We're talking about mental health, and we wonder why a lot of students are having a lot of these breakdowns and all of that, the expectations and the treatments and the that. It's very different for everybody, and that shouldn't be the case. We talk about equality, mm -hmm. but did we all start at the same level? For you to talk about equality, it assumes everybody has the same things, and the same resources, right? So equality versus equity, we've all done that in school. Like, you need to give people what they need for them to succeed, not what the whole, every, the masses need, right? So um, it's the same as when you're injured or something, and we assume that, no, you cannot have these accommodations because we have to think of everybody. Well, everyone else is not injured. It's things like that. We're always looking for those visible markers to address, but when we talk about racism and all those pieces, they're not always visible is the problem. So we need to listen is one thing when it comes to when you're in a position of power, you're an educator, you're a leader, you're whatever. Listen, first of all, don't always be ready to just answer and have generic responses. And hold yourself accountable is another thing, right? So, yeah. Exactly. Those are really great points. Um, I just had a question as to, as a clinical instructor, if there, there's a student, right, and they find that their preceptor might be 
brushing them off or like you said not paying attention to them or they feel there is a racial bias with their preceptor then how would you recommend a nursing student go about handling that I know you kind of said like ask them is there a reason you don't want to work with me but I feel like especially for myself I do not think I would ask for that at all like if I if I was in that position I would not ask my preceptor that I think I would just go to my preceptor and say mm -hmm. it is what it is probably just sit back <laughs> honestly that's what I would do so it comes back again to as a clinical instructor again first and foremost your group of students has to rely on you. And I always give students the, op like, the option. Are you feeling good about this? Do you want to address it yourself? Because you have to remember, I'm not always going to be there. I can be in the sidelines listening in, or I can actually be there to facilitate this conversation, right? And it, I've been amazed that a lot of students have been like, you know what, I'm scared, but I want to go try it on my own and see what happens. And 98% of them have come back and said, actually, we had a good conversation, right? There's been one or two incidences where it didn't go as planned, but we always have to be prepared. And I always, you know, prep the students, how do you withdraw when you see that it's going sideways, you know, and it comes to, oh, I see mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe this is not the right time to talk about this. So I think I'm just going to withdraw from the conversation. You literally withdraw as you get out. Don't give more opportunity to keep talking about it because you're not going to, right? And that's where we now sit, sit down and say, what are our next steps? Because we do have processes within the School of Nursing when we think or see um, certain levels of abusive conduct to students, um, whether it's to do with race, whether it's to do with whatever it is that we can follow when it regards. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people struggle with, oh, yes, we don't want to, um, the relationships with these places. But again, it comes back to we need to hold everyone accountable. Because as long as we keep making excuses and saying, well, we won't hold this side accountable because we need them or that side, because it becomes a, a, a battle that, you know, what's the point? Let's just carry on like nothing is happening. So it has, we have to encourage tackling it from every point. So, you know, if you're not feeling comfortable about it, then it's totally fine for, and I've, I've gone with students before, like I'm not going to say, well, I need you to feel comfortable. And sometimes it's in, in them noticing me, um, kind of walking through that, that they gain that confidence to say, oh, actually, I can, next time if I encounter this, then I want to try and do this on my own. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think that was, that's pretty helpful for me. I mean, I haven't, I, I haven't been in that situation yet, hopefully not, um, but hopefully I never am, am in that situation. But if I ever am, then I will definitely remember those words. Um, we have been on here for about an hour and 30 yeah. so i'm gonna start wrapping it up but does um does anyone have any questions yeah, Astrid, I think you have I any just, questions anyone who i think i was going to mention how um what we just discussed was really helpful to me as well because to be fair um i think i might have experienced something like that in my placement um and um i wasn't sure what my rights were if i could just address it because i really don't mind addressing um, situations like that but I wasn't sure if I'm allowed to um, and when I spoke to my clinical instructor I just you know it, it just came off as if I was incompetent or not skillful enough but I, I, I started doubting myself and you know like my capabilities as well so when I spoke to my clinical instructor I mentioned in that manner where it was like you know I just feel like it's me I'm having a bad day I'm overwhelmed but to be fair, it just wasn't the case for me. Like, you, you, as we are saying, like, some, some of the things that um, happens, you can't really put, like, a tangible thing on it to describe it. So you, you really don't know how to voice it out. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it was, it, it's been very, like, um, what you just mentioned has been very um, educational to me as well. So moving forward, if I feel as though I'm in such a situation, I'll know how to address it as well. I'm glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's we're so conditioned sometimes, right? Like to think it's me because that's just what happens when mm -hmm. we bring up. I also encourage you if you have a trusted peer, walk them through the scenario and see what they say about it, right? I always like to just start off by thinking the best of everybody. We you know, we all come to work sometimes and things are happening at home. It's not an excuse to be 
like abusive, but we know things do happen. Right. But if someone's behavior is always like that, then that's problematic. And so how do we address that? We have to protect our nursing students. And I always say to students, now that you've experienced this with somebody, it's, it's now up to you as the generations coming up to make sure when you're in that position of power as a nurse, you don't treat the next nursing student like that. Um, you see your peer who's also a nurse treating a nursing student like that. You're in the same position of power with them. So you get to go and say, hey, Gail, I noticed when you were talking to Lee there, you know, uh, do you think that was okay? Like, what was happening? Uh, you know, we really want to make sure we're, like, you know, nurturing our student. Uh, do you think it could get, have gone a different way? Do you think you could have maybe um, let them know that what they're doing, you know, like, teach them a little bit better, right? I always say to nursing students, I'm not coming to do a task with you. You have to, first of all, go, El Xavier, look up your things, have your stuff, and then we kind of go through it together. It's learning, right? But sometimes I know in, in, in our workspaces, right, right now with the pandemic, um, I give a lot of praise to those nurses that are still taking students despite what is happening in the hospitals, right? It's so stressful sometimes, and yet you really want to teach this person but the conditions you're in are not allowing you to do that. So you end up being rude to that person and doing all these things. So how do we acknowledge? Yeah. Sometimes it's a matter of saying, hey, I know today's a very busy day. You guys are short and maybe, it, you know, I, I am in the way. But how can I help? Can I do the vital sign? Mm -hmm. Right? Instead of sitting there and waiting for them to yet again. Mm -hmm. And all those, we, we also have yeah. responsibility for our actions. But at the end of the day, mm -hmm. when you're sure and you've spoken to somebody else and all this and it's still kind of feeling like that i would say address it in the moment if it's blatantly like that if if you're up for it address it but address it in a manner that again it's professional and all those pieces and it's from a place of inquiry yeah make sense make sense yeah yeah okay it does. any other all right I was asked the same thing. Are there any other questions, comments, or anything at all? I'm, just, I'm looking at the comment section. I was just wondering what advice you would give to, I guess, I know you've given us advice the whole time, but um, like, is there like any further advice you'd give to us nursing students or like people who are like aspiring to get into nursing program? I would say explore your options. It breaks mm -hmm. my heart that we continue to be in the sidelines, you know, go figure out what you want to do right um and sometimes your journey is not always going to be the traditional journey of okay you go to nursing school now you're a nurse and you're in a place for 25 years right mm -hmm. um sometimes do entre you may want to be an entrepreneur you may want to do have your own clinic that does i don't know botox uh, counseling whatever it is yeah explore and actualize your abilities right just because you you don't see a lot of people that look like you and certain it does not mean it's not doable mm -hmm. right keep expanding um keep learning keep looking for opportunities mentorships and all those pieces i'm loving what cbna is doing right now there's opportunity for mentorship and all those pieces but you know be very clear about what your values are because when you're very clear about what your values are, making decisions along the way and when you're a nurse becomes very easy. I talk mm -hmm. about getting up and leaving tables where, you know, respect and all those things are not being shown. It aligns with your values. What's acceptable to you, right? And all those pieces. But get up and do other things that are not the traditional sense of what's expected of you as a black nurse, right? Um, go into education. Go... I mean, we just had the first black uh, CEO over at LHSC. Uh, aspire for something more. If you don't, I'm not saying it's the worst thing in the world. It's okay. But again, research keeps showing us these things where we're not at those tables. And, you know, I, I, I'm curious about some of those pieces. Like, can we continue to try and shatter some of those glass? Uh, well, it's not really a glass ceiling. It's, it's more of like a block of bricks because when you really look at the intersectionality of it all um you're trying to shatter like a a, a brick wall really but what can we do and all those things? start your own businesses start your own whatever right the sky is the limit is what i say to students and when you get into a workplace and into a department give it a good six months if it's not for you 
Yeah. Nursing is hard. Do not stay in a place that you're not at least happy 70-ish percent of the time. Any job you go to, there's going to be this and that. But nursing itself, it's hard already. Being black as a nurse is hard already. So you need to find a place where you feel respected and your your capabilities are, are honored and um, it aligns with your own values as an individual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's beautiful advice. I, I really do. That's Like you said, it's not just a glass ceiling. There's like glass upon glass upon glass upon glass. And then when you put them together, it's like, it's like bricks. <laughs> so, but as we've discussed earlier, you're not going to see people in those spaces if we don't go into those spaces, mm-hmm. if we don't push our way into those spaces. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really good. And then and just before, when you apply for these jobs and, you know, you don't get a job and all those pieces, ask for that feedback i mean i've been in situations where i ask for feedback no one wants to give me feedback because you know they just didn't want to give me a job and they just kind of go with a generic you're green or something like that genuinely ask for that feedback because sometimes you know there is something in there for you to learn and every space you go into you learn something um just keep yourself open but ask for that feedback. How do I better myself for me to get to this? And what were you looking for? What did this applicant maybe have that I didn't have? And, and you know, take it from there and learn a little bit more um, and expand yourself a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nurse Linda, for coming and joining us today. And we, you know, are so, so grateful that you came and you were just sharing your experiences, giving us words of wisdom, um, giving us different perspectives as well. So thank you so much for that. And thank you to everyone who has been watching so far and has commented and shared their own um, thoughts and, and, and articles and things like that. So we really appreciate you guys. And once again, just thank you guys for coming. So much for having me. This has been uh, so much fun and it's just been as organic as we, I think, what we wanted it to be. And I mean, if, if any yes. questions or wants to reach out, I, I don't know what my Instagram handle is, um, <laughs> but you can find it on here. I was aging myself today. I'll yeah. turn on the video. Um, but I'm always, that's one thing I feel very passionate about, um, helping others, guiding others, learning from others and all those pieces. So feel feel free to reach out. And thanks to everybody for joining us, CBNA, for having Thank me. Thank you so much problem thank you once again i put your instagram handle in the comments and then i will also post a following up kind of post and just let everyone know where they can reach you at so thank you once again for coming thank you esther for also joining us and thank you everyone who's watching right now thank you bye-bye